Good afternoon. My name is Devin Cantwell, and today I will be presenting on solutions for some or for all environmental ethics and city sustainable development. The research question that I'll be tackling and discussing today is do cities implement climate adaptation and mitigation plans with equity in mind? A little bit of relevant background. First, the United Nations in a 2018 report estimated that around 78% of global emissions originate from cities. This means that while we think about climate action as being an issue that nations or international actors are primarily responsible in tackling, we actually need to start including subnational actors, i.e. actors that are below the level of the state or the country, as part of our considerations for climate change action. This means that states, regions, and cities are important actors that we need to consider when we are implementing climate change action policies. Additionally, an important consideration to keep in mind is that cities operate under two different types of plans. First, they have responsibilities and roles under the national plans, i.e. the nationally determined contributions or NDCs. These nationally determined contributions are part of the Paris Agreement um, and are part of the central strategy for countries as part of an international agreement to reduce the overall total greenhouse gas emissions. Second, um, cities also operate under localized plans. These are often called climate action plans or CAPs or CAPs. These climate action plans have more specific detailed actions that cities are committing to, to both mitigate the impact of greenhouse gas emissions and um, reduce the total emissions in the city, as well as adapt to the changing environment and climate events happening within the city. Finally, it's really important for us to note that climate change disproportionately impacts the elderly, disabled, low-income, indigenous, black, and communities of color, as well as other vulnerable groups. This means that when events like flooding happens, um, not only do we see flooding impacting the whole city and you know, damaging businesses or um, you know, kind of everyone's residences, we see the most severe impacts impacting those who are the most vulnerable. For example, um, if you are somebody that has insurance on your house, your house is well built, flooding impacts are going to be relatively easy to repair and you'll probably have capital available at hand to be able to repair it and still live in your house. For those that live in subpar housing, it means that their entire house and livelihood if their businesses are located near those are destroyed. They often don't have insurance or the insurance doesn't cover that type of flooding damage. Additionally, when we have events like flooding, these often cascade into other types of climate vulnerabilities. For example, flooding often um, means that there's you know, large amounts of standing water for um, a long period of time. There's often inadequate drainage in areas of the city that are lower income or that may have um, you know, folks that are not as prioritized by city governments. And so this attracts vector-borne illnesses if folks don't have access to um, some quality health care. Um, it means that those vector-borne illnesses become fatal for many folks um, when they could just be preventable types of diseases or illnesses in the first place. And so these issues become really interlinked with each other. And it's why it's important in a climate change strategy to not only have a general strategy for adapting and mitigating climate change, but also thinking through particularly who is most vulnerable to the impacts of climate change. I use three different types of methods in order to come to my analysis today. So first, I look at content analysis of the most recent city climate action plans for the four cities I have cho chosen. I also conduct content analysis of third party coverage of climate action, so non governmental organizations or NGOs, news articles, etc. Finally, I conducted spatial ethnographic data. Um, a data collection process in Saigon in December of 2018 and in Buenos Aires in March of 2019. And I use these in conjunction with the content analysis of the climate action plans and city climate action uh, coverage from third parties to be able to determine whether those plans were being implemented with a lens of equity in mind. So to give you a brief overview of the cities that I've studied here, I study four cities, Buenos Aires, Ho Chi Minh City or Saigon, Mexico City, and Seoul. 
All of these cities have slightly different climate threats, but there's also a significant amount of overlap. For example, you'll see vector-borne diseases, flooding and heat island effects appear in many of the cities, as does reduced air quality and air pollution issues. The areas of focus for the city climate action includes things all the way from urban forestry and green space installations, which can help reduce the impacts of heat island effects, as well as reduce the impacts of flooding on infrastructure. Um, to more social types of policies, including housing resettlement for those that are located um, in vulnerable flooding zones um, or have sun substandard housing, as well as just general poverty reduction strategies that are part and parcel of adapting and creating resiliency in the cities in the face of climate change threats. We also have more kind of traditional measures being taken by cities, such as improving transportation infrastructure and just general emissions reduction goals, which will help cities um, mitigate their overall global impact when it comes to greenhouse gases. There are several ethical dilemmas that I found with these four cities, however. I've highlighted the kind of the biggest ones here on this table. So for Buenos Aires, even though the city has made commitments for resettling those in the shanty towns that are by the river, um, including after a 2008 Supreme Court ruling where they were federally mandated to come up with a plan, Buenos Aires has so far has no evidence of actually implementing these resettlement measures, um, which also means that many of those that fall under the city's plan to um, train for emergency preparedness still haven't gotten that training. Both when, um, when observing in Buenos Aires back in March of 2019, speaking to those that still live in Buenos Aires and analyzing the third party data, Buenos Aires has not put into place any type of concrete plan to actually resettle those in the shanty towns and to mitigate their risk um, to the flooding threat within the city. In the case of Mexico City, we see that emissions in the industrial areas located on the, neath, the north and east portions of the city have actually increased, which disproportionately impacts marginalized populations. In Mexico City, there's a large amount of sprawl. So um, many people end up having to live on kind of the outskirts of the city and particularly those with less uh, income resources live in the north and east portions of the city. Um, because the public infrastructure is still being built out in terms of transportation, many folks are still having to take individual vehicles to get from their home to their work each day, often facing long commutes. There's yet to be um, a decentralization of these types of resources and workplaces that people need to be at. Um, there also is an affordability issue in terms of making sure that there is enough livable housing dispersed throughout the city and not concentrated. Furthermore, many of the industries are located in the north and east portions of the city where those who have the lowest income in the city live. So um, because the emissions in these areas have increased, the city, while they've made strides in improving transportation um, and overall the city has made some progress in emissions reductions, the fact that these have increased means that not only have folks disproportionately not benefited from the emissions reduction, but they've been disproportionately harmed in reduction uh, emissions reduction policies regarding transportation and industry emissions reductions. In the case of Saigon, um, while there have been increased installation of green spaces, the distribution of those resources, um, when you look at a district map, are more aligned to what the businesses needs are than rather the actual populations that are most vulnerable to the effects of flooding. As a result of this, the businesses are becoming uh, more fortified against the threat of flooding. However, um, those that live in substandard housing um, have the highest amount of poverty, do not receive the type of benefit that comes from green space installation, either in reducing flooding threats or reducing the heat island effects in those neighborhoods. And finally, in Seoul, although there are 11 major climate change adaptation promises and mitigation promises, um, there's only one of those major climate change actions that actually consider subpopulation vulnerability. Um, the city of Seoul, for the most part, isn't considering those that are highly marginalized or have less access to income and resources. And as a result, many of their adaptation and mitigation promises are going to be unevenly distributed and have negative impacts for those that are most vulnerable within the city population. 
This has several important implications. First, it means that we need targeted intentional plans to address inequity in climate action because cities themselves are not um, actually staying attuned to these or tracking these measures without specific intentional targets around equity. Second, it means that available financial resources are actually driving the direction and implementation of practices in climate action policy. In the case of Saigon, for example, the reason why the installations have been going in the business district is not necessarily because that is the area with the highest flooding risk, but the city sees the need to protect um, the business districts in order to attract more foreign direct investment from other countries. Because they, it is necessary for them to maintain that foreign direct investment from other countries, they are basically taking the minimal financial resources that they have available at their disposal and implementing them in the place where they think they're going to get the best return on investment for additional financial investments in the city. Furthermore, business ties tend to reduce equity and climate governance. All four of these cases, um, in instances where the city has created more business ties in order to help balance its budget, um, it's actually reduced a focus on equity in terms of making sure that that funding for the initiative being funded is actually going to those who have the least amount of resources and access to funding. What this means is that we need more equity focused international funding. And finally, um, we are now just starting to turn the corner in tracking subnational climate action, both in terms of the plans proposed, but also the effectiveness um, and efficacy of cities actually addressing the, the issues that they promised to address. So we have initiatives like the Initiative for Climate Action Transparency or ICAT. ICAT and similar initiatives though, have no measures that actually assess those plans through a lens of equity. We need to be able to add some sort of equity measure on this to know whether when a city like Mexico City is able to talk about a reduction in its overall emissions, is that being done in an equitable way? And are there folks that are left holding the baggage at the end of the day as cities make general strides? So um, I hope that this presentation helps you understand more about the relationship between climate change action and city levels, as well as um, the issue of equity and how we need to have equity focuses as we're both designing and implementing these measures. Thank you so much.